many of you know the Buddha's concept of the second arrow. Uh, but it's a good one to keep in the front of your mind. You know, we all hear it, we know it, but like remembering it on a, you know, daily basis is really helpful because the mind has no shame. It will punish us in different ways. So everyone gets the first hour, arrow of life. And I just talked about that. Throughout life, we get all kinds of first arrows, various hurts, woundings, losses of all kinds. That's the first arrow. It's not seen as a problem. It's seen as being human. It's the proliferation of the mind that comes after this first arrow. That's what exacerbates the, 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 the suffering or the pain of the first arrow. That can be the problem. A couple of years, a couple of years ago, I had a severe knee pain. And, and so I thought, well, I'll rest it. But it didn't get any better. In fact, it got worse. And I couldn't get an appointment for a number of weeks with this all too popular doctor that everybody goes to. He's an osteopath or something like that. He calls himself a joint jiggler. But he's kind of a mystical character in Charlottesville that everyone goes to when they got things wrong in their, in their joints especially. If I was unmindful, and these weeks are going by, I don't know what's wrong, it's getting worse, it's hurting more. The mind would take the bare experience of this strong sensation, or you could call it pain, and proliferate all manner of doom stories. You know, I think, oh, could this be like the beginning of rheumatoid arthritis? My mother had arthritis. Boy, that could be, that could be really crippling. And, uh, and geez, as, as a young man, year, you know, decades ago, I had, I had bone cancer. No sign of it, but is this, could this be a return? And then, you know, my knee, it's so important. I love exercising. It's part of my kind of mental well-being. And if I lose this knee, if it's some degenerative, unfixable necrosis like Bo Jackson had, you know, in his knees, well, then I, what am I going to do with that exercise? Boy, that's a big adjustment. And then the mind just won't let up, you know, if, if we're not mindful, you know. You know, if the pain keeps increasing like this, increasing like this, well, then I've got to get some painkillers, you know. And might I get hooked on painkillers, you know. <laughs> and if I get hooked on painkillers, what about my level of lucidity? You know, I kind of earn my living being, trying to be lucid and, <laughs> and teaching, you know. And if that goes... You know, well, okay, well, then no money's coming in. Well, then the house kind of goes. And then, you know, I end up under the overpass, you know, on painkillers, zonked out of my mind. <clears throat> or maybe behind the trailway station, you know, in the alley there. So, you see what the mind can do. And okay, I exaggerated a little bit for effect. But, but you get the idea. And you've all had this experience. You know, the first arrow was just the pain in the knee. It's just strong sensation. But the second, third, fourth, fifth arrows, that's the mind proliferating on and on and on. You know? But with some training in mindfulness practice, a little meditation practice that maybe gets some traction, there's an awareness, there's a uh, an earlier and early awareness of what's going on with this, with this mind. Oh, now I see what's happening. You know, I have this sensation. And then the mind is linking one thing after the other, after the other. But we don't have to follow it. If we can recognize what's going on in, in, in a gentle way, just say, oh, I, I just don't need to follow this out. No, thank you. I'm not going there now. I know this is a dead end. It solves nothing, it's not creative, and it makes me feel worse. In fact, I read somewhere where doctors say that 80% of what is actually felt 
is not physically there. It's not physically being. It's the contraction around the pain. You know, it's like that's why they give you out these those tens units when you when you tear a muscle in your back because all the muscles around the actual spot who are uninjured are like contracting around it. Well, we do that emotionally also. So that second arrow, you know, it's part of the benefit of a, of, of a spiritual training like this or a meditation practice, an awareness practice, a mindfulness practice. We just get to see things earlier and earlier. And then we have a choice. You know, and, and sometimes we shoot that second arrow at ourselves, and sometimes we shoot it at others. Through blaming and lashing out at others in some way. You know, we can't quite stand the uncomfortableness, the unpleasantness, and so we blame. Or we, or we react in some way. You know, a co- co-worker might say something unkind. And we fire right back. Then they come back at us. Then we come back at them. And then we've established the cycle. You know, it's a, it's a cycle of ill feeling or kind of verbal violence. And they're creating a feud that could simmer for years. And I don't even want to talk about families. Think about the feuds in families. You know? They go on for decades. All because we're so uncomfortable with that first arrow. We push back. You know, we get hurt and we strike back. So it is an important part of this training to learn how not to shoot that second arrow at ourselves or at other people. To learn how to be with the unpleasant without reactivity. And it doesn't mean we're doormats. That's not it. It's about skillful response. And it's certainly natural if you've had violence done to you that you want to you wanna hurt back. Dr. King says this, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. And again he says, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. He says, Have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? The chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or else we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. He didn't mince his words. Hate begetting hate. I often reflect on the aftermath of 9-11. Yes, it was extremely important to bring the perpetrators to justice. And it was very important to increase our, the power and sophistication of our intelligence gathering, working in concert with other, all the other nations in the world to stop these kind of activities before they get started. But I keep reflecting, was it prudent to invade two countries? Did the invasion of two primarily Muslim countries radicalize legions of terrorists and their supporters to the detriment of the entire world? And what will the long-term effects be? Was this another instance of a cycle of violence begetting more and more violence? I mean, time and the unfolding of history will reveal the effects more completely. And I, don't, and I don't pretend to think that I know where all this is going and, and what was 
correct and incorrect. Dr. King always addressed violence with love and understanding and a refusal and a refusal to inflict further injury. Dr. King said, wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. Wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrow. Breaking the cycle of violence is a challenging teaching. I mean, we can see it manifesting in our relationships day to day. It's that little tit for tat, tit for tat. And even in the negative, harsh attitudes that we that we have towards ourselves. And gosh, look at the news. Anytime, any day, and, and, you, and we see firsthand what Dr. King, Buddha, Gandhi, and many others have been teaching, have been talking about. A Zen master was dying and his students came to him and asked for his final words to clarify them what their spiritual practice was all about. What is Zen, they asked. And those of you who have studied Zen know that it can be pretty obtuse at times. You know, it's beautiful, it's aesthetic, and it's obtuse. They wanted a clear answer before he cut out on them. You know, he was dying, he was the master, and they are like, kind of, what am I doing? And he said this, Zen is the appropriate response to the moment. Zen is the appropriate response to the moment. Dr. King, the Buddha, I believe responded appropriately in the times that they lived. But that's our challenge too, individually, collectively, to every situation. What is the appropriate response? Whether we're dealing with our children or whether we're looking at some collective issue, the economy or the environment, etc. And Dr. King's appropriate response was, in almost all cases, wise, compassionate, and courageous. Very inspirational for millions. But it's not easy. You can't be fooled. If you want to be more than a spiritual hobbyist, it takes a lot of courage to take up a spiritual practice. To look deeply inside first. To stand in there and look at our own reactivity and conditioning. And some of it may not be very pretty. And one teacher said, uh, self-knowledge is often bad news. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but to turn toward, to learn to turn toward and directly experience our, experience our suffering without turning away. To stand in with our own suffering. And then to turn outward and to be able to be and learn to be with others in a compassionate way when they are suffering in the depths of their struggles. It's a lot to ask. And this requires a lot of courage. And bringing this practice into the world um, often meets with tremendous resistance. To speak honestly what, what needs to be said Dr. King, Gandhi, Jesus, and many others over the course of history lost their lives. You're killed for their efforts. 
as they struggle to bring just a sense of justice to the world. And even the Buddha met tremendous resistance. The way he was operating his, his, uh, his order was directly against the caste system 2,500 years ago in India. He got a lot of resistance. And an attempt was made on his life by his cousin. King said this uh, shortly before his death. <clears throat> really s speaks to the courage that, that, that pulsed through his veins. <clears throat> you may be 38 years old, as I happen to be, and one day some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause, and you refuse to do it because you are afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you will lose your job. Or you are afraid that you will be criticized. Or that you will lose your popularity. Or you're afraid that somebody will stab you or shoot at you or bomb your house. So you, so you refuse to take the stand. Well, you may go on and live until you are 90, but you're just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. And the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. If we can remember and cultivate <clears throat> intentions, intentions that point us towards an appropriate response, a response that holds within it wisdom, a response that holds within it compassion, a response that holds within it courage, and bring just the, the, the best of our ability to that. If we can remember those three, wisdom, compassion, and courage, bringing that to every situation to the best of our ability. I want to read one more quote from Dr. King. Well, I don't know what will happen now, We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up on the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So I'd like to I'd like to end tonight and, and play an excerpt from maybe his most famous speech, I Have a Dream. And I won't comment after that because I can't comment after that. So just sit back, maybe close your eyes. It's about five minutes, a little less. And allow the full import of the man's wisdom it's compassion and courage just kind of rattle, rattle around inside. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, 
I still have a dream. Yes. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Yes. I have a dream that one day yes. this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yes. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of Injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last. Free
free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you for your attention.